Let's be honest. For most people, even for historians, the study of history is dull. Memorizing an endless barrage of dates, events, and names of historical figures is tedious, mind-numbing, and honestly useless. Those insignificant pieces of information, they don't help you choose what to buy at the grocery store. They don't tell you how to get a high score on a math exam. Another useless thing to study, right? And worst of all, as soon as you remember that date, one week later, you've forgotten it. What seals the feelings you have of dislike towards history, however, isn't that. It's looking at that score on your test, 75%, 82%, maybe even a 91%, and realizing how hard you tried, and still you weren't smart enough to get that high score you felt you deserved. While there are some of us who love history, and they say quite loudly, most people don't. They are not fans. I have a question for you. Is history more than the dates, events, and names of historical figures? Even further, how do we know that those dates, events, and names of historical figures are correct? What if we are all living in the Matrix, and all of history has been made up by a super smart AI? Or, what if that history made by that super smart AI keeps changing? Would you even know the difference? Now. Let's pose a common situation. Let's say your mother told you that your great-grandmother married your great-grandfather in 1944. Who cares, right? You also know that your great-grandfather was a soldier in World War II, because when you were a little kid, you saw his old rifle when you visited his house, and he let you touch it. But you have a problem. World War II lasted until 1945, not 1944. Did your mother lie to you about when her grandparents got married? Did her parents lie to her? So, you go to your mom, and you ask her. She is also curious because she never thought about it. A week later, she comes to you with a funny look on her face. She is holding a document in her hand, the marriage certificate of her grandparents. The certificate says they were married in 1944. But she also found out that her grandpa didn't come back from the Pacific, also known as the Asia-Pacific War or the Pacific Theater of World War II, until 1946. So, what is it? Did they somehow get married in 1944 while your great-grandpa was fighting the Japanese? Or did the person who did the marriage certificate make a mistake, and your grandparents never caught it? Or perhaps they never cared? Your mom told you they moved from Ohio to California after the war, so maybe they just never wanted or cared to travel back to Ohio to get the documents fixed. This raises an important question. How do we know that history is real? If a clerk at a courthouse can make a mistake on a document as important as a marriage certificate, which happens all the time, how do we know that the other dates, events, or even figures in history are real? History relies on a careful negotiation between two kinds of documents, primary and secondary documents. Primary documents, also known as primary sources, are government records, first-hand accounts, autobiographies, photographs, videos, letters, diaries. Basically, any kind of qualitative research, such as interviews, surveys, polls, as well as physical material objects. Secondary documents, also known as secondary sources, on the other hand, they describe, analyze, interpret, and evaluate those primary documents. These things can be books, encyclopedias, essays, or even documentaries. Finding out the truth isn't just about reading a marriage certificate and taking it at face value. If we want to know the truth of what happened, we must look at many types of documents in many places at many times and discover what may be the truth, not what is the truth. Just because you read something in a newspaper or a magazine doesn't mean that journalist or writer was telling you the truth. Just because that journalist or writer has received awards or is famous or has written many books doesn't mean that person is sincere. That writer could be lazy. He could be paid by someone to write something because he has a famous name. Or he could just have run out of time 
and needed to submit something to his editor or else he would lose the chance to publish his article because the printers were going to print the magazine the next day. Without careful investigation of both primary and secondary documents, you just don't know. And you may never know. Are you willing to accept that what came before you is a fiction? Do you care about finding the truth about when your great-grandparents were married? Do you want to know why World War II happened? Why the whole world went to war and tried to kill each other? Do you think that's something important? That's why the study of dates, events, and names of historical figures are important. Not for an exam, not for a grade, and not so that you can show off to people about your amazing memorizing brain. History is important because it tells us who we were, and without knowing who we were, how can we know who we are, or who we can become? So, let's talk about primary documents. That's a good place to start, since without primary documents, we really don't know anything about history. Regardless of whether a primary document or primary source is true, we know three things about primary documents. Number one, primary documents are reliable. They exist as a testament to a time, place, and person. They were created during a particular time, at a certain place, by an individual. Therefore, a primary document is a reliable testament to that time. The information in that primary document can be in question, but the fact that the document itself exists as a dated object tells us that something happened somewhere to someone. Primary documents are physical evidence of something happening in the past. Number two, primary documents have embedded meaning. Like I said before, no matter whether what is said is true, we know that primary documents have a meaning for that particular time. If you can find many primary documents corroborating that idea or ideas, you know that during that time there were many people who thought or felt the same way. I'm sure personally you have one or two ideas that you are positive no one else has. If you wrote those ideas down in a blog or a journal and someone found your blog in 100 years, would it be safe to assume that everyone who was around you had the same ideas as you? No, because those ideas you felt at the time were only your ideas. However, what if that person who found your blog also found a hundred other blogs with the same idea? It would be safe to assume that many people had that idea, even if you thought your idea was just your own original idea. Therefore, studying your blog would help understand why so many people had that idea. Your blog carries within it embedded meaning about your time, your people, and your culture. Number three, primary documents are necessary. Most people read books to learn about history. However, one big criticism of books today is that many of the books are lying about many things. Those books take primary documents and they spin them around and around until the primary document can only mean one thing instead of many things. Just like you believed that idea was just your own original idea uh, in your blog, Someone much later discovers that many people have that idea, so there can be many meanings to a primary document, and many of these meanings can be correct. You were correct in thinking that idea was your own idea. After all, it came from your brain, and no one told you that idea. However, you did not know that many other people also had that same idea. Therefore, Primary documents are necessary for us so that we can better understand the past. And by understanding the past, we can better understand ourselves. If we don't have those primary documents, there is no way we can try to verify the past. So, how can you use primary sources to investigate history? In 1842, an American sailor deserted his crew on the South Pacific island of Nukuhiva. While he was on the island, the sailor remembered how he encountered a tribe of cannibals and how they took him in and he was able to experience their culture. This is what he said. 
From the verdant surfaces of the large stones that lay scattered about, the natives were now sliding off into the water, diving and ducking beneath the surface in all directions, the young girls springing buoyantly into the air and revealing their naked forms to the waist, with their long tresses dancing about their shoulders, their eyes sparkling like drops of dew in the sun, and their gay laughter pealing forth at every frolicsome incident. On the afternoon of the day that I took my first bath in the valley, we received another visit from Heavy. The noble savage seemed to be in the same pleasant mood, and was quite as cordial in his manner as before. After remaining about an hour, he rose from the mats, and motioning to leave the house, invited Toby and myself to accompany him. I pointed to my leg, but Mehevi in his turn pointed to Cory Cory, and removed that objection. So, mounting upon the faithful fellow's shoulders again, like the old man of the sea astride of Sinbad, I followed after the chief. When he returned to America and published his encounters with Mehevi the noble savage four years later, Herman Melville became an overnight sensation, most popularly known for his American classic Moby Dick. The idea of the noble savage was a popular meme during the 19th century. In 1839, Charles Darwin published his narrative of the surveying voyages of His Majesty's ships, Adventure, and Beagle. Excerpts from his voluminous personal travel diaries when he visited South America and Patagonia. In his diary, Darwin commented on the people of Tahiti. There is a mildness in the expression of their countenances which at once banishes the idea of a savage, and intelligence which shows that they are advancing in civilization. The Tahitian surprised Charles. Earlier on in his voyage, he encountered people living on the southern shores of Patagonia, to which he said, It was without exception the most curious and interesting spectacle I ever beheld. I could not have believed how wide was the difference between savage and civilized man. It is greater than between a wild and domesticated animal, inasmuch as in man there is a greater sense, greater power of improvement. Some years later, Charles Dickens, the famous British novelist, recalled in an 1853 essay about traveling to St. George's Gallery in London and witnessing a group of real, breathing, red-blooded Zulu kafirs as an exhibit in the museum. These noble savages are represented in a most agreeable manner. They are seen in an elegant theater fitted with appropriate scenery of great beauty, and they are described in a very sensible and unpretending lecture, delivered with a modesty which is quite a pattern to all similar exponents. Though extremely ugly, they are much better shaped than such of their predecessors as I have referred to, and they are rather picturesque to the eye, though far from odiferous to the nose. What do these primary documents tell us about 19th century? Did noble savages really exist? Should we take those esteemed men at their word? Is this the real me? Or is this me? What about this? How do you really know who I am? And now, a poem. It was six men of Indostan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall, against his broad and sturdy side at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling the tusk, cried, Ho, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp? To me tis very clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus bolding up he spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out an eager hand, and felt about the knee. What most the wondrous beast is like is very plain, quoth he, tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, Even the blinded man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can, this marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. 
The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope, than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. In 1873, the poet John Godfrey Sachs published this poem, The Blind Men and the Elephant. The poem explains the importance of looking at an event or situation from many different perspectives, appreciating them, and realizing that you and I must also own our own perspectives. The study of history is the careful negotiation of primary and secondary documents. By studying the complexities of these primary and secondary documents, we can begin to trace out the meaning of those who came before and the legacy we live.